uh, the third book. As I say, when we looked at the structure of Paradise last time, um, we're going to have a council uh, in heaven. There'll be a second council in book 10. Remember the structure of the book. The structure of the book is actually important. Normally the structure of a book doesn't matter that much, but here the symmetry is just so obvious all over the place that you, you, you have to see significant design to it and also not just in terms of place, but even in terms of uh, theme. So we began in hell, which does not make Satan his hero, other than he's starting off and he's, he's thus far received the uh, lion's share of the action and speeches. Uh, we move to heaven. And Milton writes in his argument that God sees what is happening and, for, and, and points this out to his son who is at his right hand and foretells the success of Satan in perverting mankind. And then he deals with the consequences of this. And these are theological consequences. And uh, we have here what some have found least persuasive about Milton's epic. I'm not convinced they're correct, but they find that uh, Milton's God sounds a bit like a theologian. And that may well be true. But he is going to have to deal with the problems of mercy and justice, providence, foreknowledge, and at the same time the allowance or sufferance of evil to happen even though he is good. How can these things all happen in a way that we're going to do what Milton said he wanted to do at the outset, which is to justify the ways of God to men. But without book three, there can be no justification because this is the, the justification is being given here. So again, when in an undergraduate course where you are taught or are given extracts from Paradise Lost and they leave out book three, there's, it's, <laughs> it can't but fail to achieve what Milton intended it to. So you can cut out some passages by all means, but I don't think you can cut out book three. Nor do I think you should cut out book two, the, at least the, the passage where uh, sin and death come forth and meet Satan. These, these are in, important uh, features for any editor to include, but never mind. So we'll get into the theological issues, but before, before we do that, we have to recognize that we are going to encounter for a second time an invocation. And again, the symmetry of there of, of those is also evident in the epic. Books one and three have invocations. It's a 12 book epic. So the first and the third books of the first half, we will find the first and the third books of the second half likewise. So books seven and nine also have invocations. all of which makes the work that much more remarkable, the architecture of it. But it's appropriate in this case because he's just left hell and as a Christian poet recognizes the problem of hell is caused by sin and he himself is subject to sin and needs to transcend that problem and cannot do it on his own. And if hell were dark, or was dark, then heaven being light will need an invocation appropriate to that. And so he does exactly that. He hails light in a way that we can see is echoes John's gospel. Light shines in the darkness, etc. A lot of that sort of language in John's gospel. Milton echoes that here. He does something else, however. He does refer a little bit more to himself in this. And there's a great deal in the four invocations that are self-referential that we don't see in the traditional uh, invocations. It's much more personal, circumstantial even. And we'll see that briefly after I read it. Hail, holy light offspring of heaven, firstborn, or of the eternal. Why of firstborn? 
first line of the Bible. In the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth. And he said, let there be light. Second line there. Let there be light. Firstborn. Or of the eternal, co-eternal beam. So there's in, the t in temporal terms, firstborn, first created, light. Or if you want to see it in a more metaphysical way, since God is light, let's talk about it in eternal terms. Or of the eternal, co-eternal beam, may I express the unblamed, since God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. And never but an unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee. Bright affluence of bright essence in create. Or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream, whose fountain who shall tell? Before the sun, before the heavens, thou wert, and at the voice of God, as with a mantle, didst invest the rising world of waters, dark and deep. One from the void and formless infinite. Thee I revisit now with bolder wing, escaped the Stygian pool, though long detained in that obscure sojourn, while in my flight, through utter and through middle darkness, born with other notes than to the Orphe Orphean lyre I sung of chaos and eternal night. Taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent, and up to reascend though hard and rare. Thee I revisit safe, and feel thy sovereign vital lamp. But thou revisits not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray, and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs, or dim suffusion veiled. Refer reference to his blindness. So he looks at the light, he sees no light. He's lost his sight totally, utterly, has no sight. He's not a little bit blind, he's totally blind. Yet not the more cease I to wander where the muses haunt, clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill, smit with the love of sacred song, but chief thee, Zion, and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow nightly I visit. Nor sometimes forget those other two equaled with me in fate, so were I equaled with them in renown, blind Thamiris and blind Maonides, and Tiresias and Phineas, prophets bold, prophets old. Then Feed on thoughts that voluntary move harmonious numbers. As the wakeful bird sings darkling and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus with the year seasons return, but not to me returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom or summer's rose or flocks or herds or human face divine. But cloud instead and ever during dark surrounds me from the cheerful ways of men cut off. And for the book of knowledge fair presented with a universal blank of nature's works to me expunged and raised. And wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather thou. Uh, celestial light shine inward and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes all mist from thence, purge and disperse that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. How appropriate it is that he's about to describe something that is spiritual, invisible, that he has no sight to describe it. He's almost fit to describe it by his circumstances suited to do something that no mortal man or I has seen. It's called making lemonade out of lemons. <laughs> I've lost my sight. I'm about to describe something that can't be seen. 
there's good precedent for this as well. Homer himself being an epic poet, Thimerus, Tiresias, all considered to be prophets. Talks about the loss of sight, but presents it again in the cheeriest possible manner, and no doubt believes it as well. And he's going to describe light. What sort of light? Well, it's the, the, the light of the sun is an analogy for this, which we may appeal to because we need light in order to see, but he's already described hell in terms of a place where there is no light, but rather darkness visible. Now he's going to talk about a place in which there's light, but it's not light we can see. Theologizing in his uh, descriptions throughout. Terrific stuff. The Book of Knowledge Fair is just simply uh, creation itself, reference to Calvin's Institutes, uh, Book 1, Section 5, if you're interested. Two books, Book of Knowledge, Book of Grace. Um, so there's how he begins. Any comments, questions? If not, I will just go on. Yeah, I'll do that. So now, the narrative proper begins. Now, had the Almighty Father from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, now the Empyrean, if you're looking at it from the old cosmology, the Empyrean is above this, Uh, where is it? Hmm. That should work. Does it call it the Imperium? No, it doesn't here. It does in other. I've seen it. No, okay, forget it. But it's above and outside the, the created universe, which is the astro astronomical cosmologies. It's outside of that outside everything busy. Now had the Father Almighty from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, high throned above all height. There's a good way of putting it. High throned above all height. Bent down his eye, his own works and their works at once to view. About him all the sanctities of heaven stood thick as stars and from his sight received beatitude past utterance. On his right, the radiant image of his glory sat, his only son. On earth, he first beheld our two first parents, yet the only two of mankind, in the happy garden placed. Reaping immortal fruits of joy and love, uninterrupted joy, unrivaled love in blissful solitude, he then surveyed hell and the gulf between, and Satan there, coasting the wall of heaven, and on this side, night in the dun air sublime, and ready now to stoop with wearied wings and willing feet on the bare outside of this world that seemed firm land embosomed without firmament, uncertain which, in ocean or in air, him God beholding from his prospect high, wherein past, present, future he beholds, thus to his only son foreseeing spate. So note the portrait. He sees, he sees everything all at once, and he also sees past, present, and future. So all uh, space and all time. That's the perspective. Remember, God's being is God. Here's Milton's problem. He's describing heaven, which is a spiritual reality which can't be seen. It's also outside space and time. How on earth does one describe such things other than through accommodationist language? But again, when in scripture, God is spoken of as having a right arm and a, and a hand and, and, and so forth, it's accommodationist language. We are persons, we're made in the image of God, therefore we take our image and project it back. More is meant by image than appearance. Our moral nature, for instance, you can't see a moral nature. You can see evidence of it in an action, but you can't actually, it's not a visible thing. It's not like, a, like your skin or your hair. <laughs> Likewise, the capacity to reason, to think in categories that hold things together, appeal to that. Again, 
it's like a number. You, you can't see a number either. You can write a number down, but that, the actual thing that is a number, there is no such object. It's a term that we use to describe it, um, a necessary concept, a necessary rational concept. But he looks and he is now going to foretell what happens. Only begotten son, seest thou what rage transports our adversary, whom no bounds prescribed, no bars of hell, nor all the chains heaped on him there, nor yet the main abyss wide interrupt can hold. So bent he seems on desperate revenge that shall redound upon his own rebellious head. And now, through all restraint, broke loose, he wings his way, not far off heaven in the precincts of light, directly towards the new created world and man there placed with purpose to assay if him by force he can destroy or worse by some false guile pervert and shall pervert cut to the chase and shall pervert for man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command who sole pledge of his obedience so will fall he and his faithless progeny. Whose fault? Whose but his own? In great he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. Not free, what proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith or love, where only what they needs must do appeared, not what they would? What praise could they receive? What pleasure I from their such obedience paid when will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity not me. It's not a fatalistic universe. They, therefore, as to right, belonged. So were created, nor can justly accuse their maker, or their making, or their fate, as if predestination, or ruled their will, disposed by absolute decree, or high foreknowledge. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If, I. if I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. So, without least impulse or shadow of fate, or aught by me immutably foreseen, they trespass, author to themselves and all, both what they judge and what they choose. For so I formed them free, and free they must remain, till they enthrall themselves. I else must change their nature and revoke the high decree, unchangeable, eternal, which ordained their freedom. They themselves ordained their fall. The first sort, the Satan and the rebel angels, the first sort by their own suggestion fell. Self-tempted, self-depraved, man falls deceived by the other first. Man, therefore, shall find grace, the other none. In mercy and justice both, through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel. But mercy first and last shall brightest shine. It's a fascinating passage. And one of the things that strikes me about it is the way in which God lightly passes over it. He's untroubled by it. He see, foresees, he explains its connection with the nature of the beings he created, namely that they were free. Of course, he would know what was going to happen, but he bore no fault in the happening because he created them free. I mean, genuinely free. And the proof of the freedom is that they did something that is unbecoming of them or him. At the same time, he pronounces grace, the Father, 
immediately. This is what will happen. Uh, all sorts of things can be said about this passage. Um, one, uh, and the, I mean, then there are famous lines here as well in this um, about man's nature. Just and right sufficient to stood though free to fall. As uh, it says in the footnote here, the kernel of Milton's sense of free will. And you can look at the debate between Erasmus and Luther on this, on the bondage of the will or on free will. A lot of discussion about that. Here, the discussion is about the nature of Adam and Eve. It's not about human nature in general. Human nature now has fallen in human nature. We do not have the free will that Adam and Eve did. Because of original sin, we are, we are born in sin. That means we're in bondage to it. We don't have the free will uh, to do what Adam and Eve did, which is to worship God aright and to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what we're commanded to do, but we have no power to do it. And we demonstrate that by not doing it. <laughs> That's the proof. If we had free will, we would do that. Someone would do that, but there's no one righteous, not even one. All have sinned. So we don't have free will this way anymore. Simply not. That's Luther's point. We are in bondage. And he will cite, among other things, Romans 7, which will talk exactly about that. The things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that I do want to do, I don't do. And I keep on doing that in both cases. I'm, I do exactly what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I do want to do. What on earth? How can I escape this conundrum? Thanks be to God. Because God does it. Like he frees us from the God in his grace, which is pronounced there right at the end. God does what no human being can do. He frees us from the grip of sin. So we are slaves. And, and Paul puts it in language that Milton's not using it here. Uh, we, are, we, we have no choice of freedom. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to be a slave to something. Either we're a slave to sin or we're a slave to righteousness. And whose righteousness? Not ours, but Christ's. So that uh, it says in the Heidelberg Catechism right at the beginning. All right, put it up on the thing here. Oh, that's so small. What is your only comfort in life and death that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. So there's the freedom. Freedom not to do whatever we want to do, but free, freed. We're freed. We're not free. We're freed. It's, a, it's the result of an action. We might have freed will. Not, we don't have free will. So it's a consequence. And we demonstrate that it's free by doing something that um, we would not do otherwise, which is to love God. If the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. So this idea, but then note that they were just and right, and they, they could have stood. They were sufficient to have stood. There was no necessity in the, in the fall. It's not that Adam and Eve lacked anything, but they did have a choice. They did have a choice. And why did they have a choice? Well, because he created all the beings this way, that were celestial. God doesn't demand in the sense of compel obedience. Otherwise, he, he's not receiving what he, what he is, beings like himself, who is in his nature love. Love and compulsion don't go together. Because as, as the Father says, they would have worshipped necessity, or they had served necessity, not me.
They therefore as to right belonged and so were created nor can justly accuse their maker. And we can refer to predestination, but that didn't, they weren't predestined to fall as if they were fated. We're not acknowledging an aspect of an essential aspect. The, the best way that we can think about this is through analogy and the experience of love and the choice therein. And yet, even observe in that, there's a sense of uh, attraction or even compulsion. You've sort of, we call it falling in love. You choose to love this person. At the same time, you feel, I can't help myself. There's an element, uh, even a tension in that. which uh, is bespoken here. Now that's just an analogy. God's love is not like ours. And so then it will say again in 1 John 1, 7 and 8, this is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and gave his son as a propitiation. So love is defined by its greatest, highest representation, the agape love of God. And that norms the other forms like erotic love or friendship love or from familiarity or family love, storge. But note, um, he ordained their freedom, they ordained their fall. So the blame is on who? Entirely on them, except not quite entirely, because they were deceived. And God thinks that that consideration matters significantly and therefore pronounces grace. But note that it is the Father that pronounces grace. There's no room here for a, an interpretation that's going to present God the Father as angry, judgmental, full of wrath, a rule, you know, like a, like a, a taskmaster producing all sorts of rules, the, the Old Testament God. And then we get Jesus who's forgiving and loving, etc. They're the, they're the same. They're of the same mind at all times. The law has a certain function. It's to drive us to show our sin. It's to convict us of sin. It's to push us towards righteousness. It does have a function, but the function is not to save. It can't save us. Never was intended to. But if you do obey this, you will live. Moses says that in Deuteronomy holds before you blessings and curses do these and you will live don't and you will be cursed and die again the instruction going on there but you cannot be saved by keeping the law because we're lawbreakers still has a use but note again the natures of the persons of the godhead here the Father it is who says that grace shall be shown before the Son even responds. Now, the Son does respond. And Milton's uh, description of what happens after the speech is important as well. Thus, while God spake, ambrosial fragrance filled all heaven, and in the blessed spirit's elect, sense of new joy ineffable diffused. Beyond compare, the Son of God was seen most glorious. In him all his Father shone substantially expressed, and in his face divine compassion visibly appeared. Love without end, and without measure grace, which thus uttering he to his Father spake. Now what is he doing? Why, why is it he being portrayed this way? Because it's showing God in his true nature. It's God's, when God shows us his, gra his grace, he's showing us his face. This is his this is what he's really like. You can't tolerate sin. That would be unjust. But he is gracious. And his response to the Father's speech, O Father, gracious was that word which closed thy sovereign sentence, that man should find grace, for which both heaven and earth shall high extol thy praises and with innumerable sound of hymns and sacred songs wherewith thy throne and compass shall resound thee ever blessed. For should man finally be lost, should man thy creature late so loved, thy youngest son fall circumvented thus by fraud, though joined with his own folly? 
that be from thee far. That far be from thee, Father, who art judge of all things made, and judgest only right. Or shall the adversary thus obtain his end and frustrate thine? Shall he fulfill his malice and thy goodness bring to naught? Or proud return, though to his heavier doom, yet with revenge accomplished, and to hell draw after him the whole race of mankind by him corrupted? Or wilt thou thyself abolish thy creation and unmake for him what for thy glory thou hast made? so should thy goodness and thy greatness both be questioned and blasphemed without defense. Note the son's immediate response is for the father's honor and reputation and glory. He's not even thinking about mankind here. He's thinking about the father's glory. And this is, in, it's just, uh, you hear Christians and you hear pastors talk about how important we are to God and so forth. God's uh, chief concern is his own honor and glory. And we are brought into the uh, consideration there because we're a part of that but actually the focus of all the godhead is even god himself of course he will receive grace because otherwise his deity and his goodness would be besmirched by satan's actions to whom the great creator thus replied o son in whom my soul hath chief delight Son of my bosom, son who art alone my word, my wisdom, and effectual might, all hast thou spoken as my thoughts are, all as my eternal purpose hath decreed. Man shall not quite be lost, but saved who will, yet not of will in him, but grace in me, freely vouchsafed. Once more I will renew his lapsed powers, though forfeited and enthralled by sin to foul exorbitant desires. Upheld by me, yet once more he shall stand on even ground against his mortal foe. By me upheld, that he may know how frail his fallen condition is. And to me owe all his deliverance, and to none but me. Some, oh, let, me oh, let me stop with this for a second. Not of will in him. Prevenient grace. The, God, the grace comes that allows us to receive, turn to God in faith. It come, the grace comes and that provokes a response. In the same way that we see that Christ chooses his disciples. We call the apostles. They don't follow him like the crowd does. He picks them out. The crowd who follows him do not necessarily believe in him. They're there for the food or for the spectacle. He still, in his grace, teaches them his nature and so forth, but it, he chooses the disciples, handpicks them. That's grace on his part, and his grace is always effectual. Comes forth. Uh, uh, Milton weighing in on uh, Calvinist theology here. Yep, showing his adherence to this. <coughs> Although there, there are some who say and that there are elements here of uh, Arminian theology as well, um, making salvation uh, dependent on people's will to avail themselves of grace. But actually, it's abundantly clear that it's not of their choice to avail themselves of that grace, but rather God's predisposing them to it. The initiative all begins with God. Now, when they respond, it's not that they don't will it, but it's because their will has been freed. Okay. And that's underlined at the end there. Uh, he owes all his deliverance and to none but me, not his will, in other words. Some I have chosen elect of, uh, of peculiar grace, elect above the rest, so is my will. The rest shall hear me call and oft be warned their sinful state, and to appease betimes the insensate deity, what, which, while offered grace, invites, for I will clear their senses dark, what may suffice, and soften stony hearts to pray, repent, and bring obedience due. To prayer, repentance, and obedience due, though but endeavored with sincere intent, my near 
shall not be slow, mine eye not shut, and I will place within them as, as a guide my umpire conscience, whom if they will hear, light after light well used, they shall attain, and to the end persisting, safe arrive. This my long sufferance and my day of grace, they who neglect and scorn, shall never taste. But hard be hardened, blind be blinded more, that they may stumble on and deeper fall, and none but such from mercy I exclude. So he concludes that passage right there. Um, none will exclude. And then he has to change the discussion point a little bit. All is not done. So mercy or grace has been articulated. There will be grace shown and they will respond to the grace. But there is a, it's, not cheap grace. There's going to be a heavy cost borne for this. Yet all is not done. Man, disobeying disloyal breaks his fealty and sins against the high supremacy of heaven, affecting Godhead, acting as if he were God. That's what happens when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall be as gods. He's affecting Godhead, and so losing all. To expiate his treason hath not left, but to destruction, sacred and devote. He with his whole posterity must die. Die he, or justice must, unless for him some other able and as willing, pay the rigid satisfaction, death for death. Say, heavenly powers, where shall we find such love? Which of ye will be mortal to redeem man's mortal crime? And just the unjust to save, dwells in all heaven charity so dear. Death is not a punishment note here, it's a satisfaction for the treason that's been committed. God is being shown justice by the fact that they're dying. They're not being punished by, de by death. His justice is being satisfied that there's something born of this. You have to understand this. Um, so it's, it's, it's the uh, Anselmic satisfaction theory to some degree, but also including some of the ransom theory of Irenaeus. Because somebody, who's going who's to pay? The price here. Who's going, to, who's going to be the ransom? Dwells in all heaven, charity so dear. He asked, but all the heavenly choir stood mute. Remember I talked about this back in, in hell when Satan says, okay, one of us is going to go forth. And, uh, and then suddenly you hear crickets. <laughs> There's no, no one's responding. Stood mute and silence was in heaven on man's behalf, patron or intercessor. None appeared. Much less that durst upon his own head draw the de deadly forfeiture and ransom set. And now without redemption, all mankind must have been lost, adjudged to death and hell by doom severe. Had not the Son of God, in whom the fullness dwells of love divine, his dearest mediation thus renewed. Father, thy word is past, man shall, shall find grace. And shall grace not find means that finds her way, the speediest of thy winged messengers to visit all thy creatures, and to all comes unprevented, unimplored, unsought, happy for man so coming, he her aid can never seek, once dead in sins and lost. This is a happy occurrence. You're, you're not even looking for it. You can't, in fact. <coughs> Atonement for himself or offering meat, indebted and undone, hath none to bring. Behold me then, <coughs> me for him. Life for life I offer, on me let thine anger fall. Account me man, I for his sake will leave thy bosom, and this glory next to thee freely put off. And for him, lastly, die well pleased. On me let death wreak all his rage. Under his gloomy power I shall not long lie vanquished. 
Thou hast given me to possess life in myself forever. By thee I live. Look at John 5, 26 here, by the way. As the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. By thee I live. Though now to death I yield, and am his due, that all that of me can die, yet that debt paid, thou wilt not leave me in the loathsome grave his prey, nor suffer my unspotted soul forever with corruption there to dwell. <coughs> but I shall rise victorious and subdue my vanquisher, spoil of his vaunted spoil. Death, his death's wound shall then receive and stoop inglorious of his mortal sting disarmed. <coughs> I through the ample air and triumph high shall lead hell, captive maugre hell, and show the powers of darkness bound. Thou at the sight pleased out of heaven shall look down and smile. While by thee raised I ruin all my foes. Then with the multitude of my redeemed shall enter heaven long absent and return. Father, to see thy face, wherein no cloud of anger shall remain, but peace assured and reconcilement, wrath shall be no more thenceforth, but in thy presence joy entire. Death shall die. 1 Corinthians 15. Death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy... Right? Death, where is thy... <laughs> so his words are ended and his meek aspect silent yet spake and breathed immortal love to mortal men above which only shone filial obedience above which shone the obedience of the son to the father that was above his concern for even mankind as a sacrifice glad to be offered he attends the will of his great father admiration seized all heaven what this might mean and whither ten wondering but soon the almighty thus replied Note the references uh, to uh, Scripture here throughout. As I say, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, which uh, sin herself back in book 2, uh, 734 mentioned. She will not live because her day is, days are numbered. And he will spoil the principalities and powers, Colossians 2, 15 and so forth. Response to this, the Father says, O thou in heaven and earth, the only peace found out for mankind under wrath. O thou my soul complacence. Well thou knowest how dear to me are all my works, nor man the least, though last created, that for him I spare thee from my bosom and right hand to save by losing thee a while the whole race lost. Thou therefore whom thou only canst redeem their nature also to thy nature join and be thyself man among men on earth made flesh when time shall be a virgin seed by wondrous birth be thou in Adam's room the head of all mankind though Adam's son as in him perish all men so in thee as from a second root all shall be restored shall be restored as many as are restored. Without thee, none. His crime makes guilty all his sons. Thy merit imputed shall absolve them who renounce their own both righteous and unrighteous deeds and live in thee transplanted and from thee receive new life. So man, as is most just, shall satisfy for man, be judged and die, and dying rise and rising with him, raise his brethren, ransom from his own dear life. So having love, shall outdo hellish hate, giving to death and dying to redeem. So dearly to redeem what hellish hate so easily destroyed and still destroys in those who, when they may, accept not grace. Nor shalt thou by descending it to assume man's nature lessen or degrade thine own. God will remain God and he will at the same time be man. The two natures of God. Fully man, fully God. Look at the uh, Council of Chalcedon on this. 
He's both. He does not lose his divinity. He doesn't lose his humanity. He doesn't be, become a composite of the two. The two natures are separate, and b yet b Christ will have both of these. Because thou hast, though throned in highest bliss, equal to God, and equally enjoying God-like fruition, quit it all to save a world from utter loss, and hast been found by merit more than birthright, son of God, founts worthiest to be so by being good, far more than great or high, because in thee love hath abounded more than glory abounds, therefore thy humiliation shall exalt with thee thy manhood also to this throne. So it's not just that God will go back to being God. Man will be exalted in this. Your manhood will also receive its perfection. This is the, I, I guess I have to finish here. <clears throat> this is the whole basis for um, teaching to people is in Christ we have a fully human person that we can follow because it's the fullness of God. We're not just believing in a divine being. We are following a, a human being that is the model of perfection for ourselves in every way. <clears throat> there shalt thou sit incarnate, here shall reign both God and man. So he will reign as king over all of creation thereafter. I guess I have to finish there. I don't want to, but that will be it for today. <clears throat>